Thank you for joining Hopeside Vespers. Today is uh, July 21, 2023. Hope you enjoyed that great song. What a day that'll be because as we see all around us, uh, even things are not getting better in one sense. And people definitely, one way or the other, are not seeing great examples of uh, leadership at least in the news. But uh, we are still supposed to be not giving up and uh, focused on completing the mission. So this being the fourth week of the month, here's a quotation for your reflection. It says, uh, one way, that is Jesus, and one job, evangelism. So let us uh, be mindful of that great uh, commission that we have been given 
because we will not be spending eternity here in this way or on this planet. That is by T.L. T. L. Osborne. One way, that is Jesus. One job, that is evangelism. In fact, I had the opportunity to, uh, in a way, witness to those who don't believe that Jesus is uh, God or uh, somehow that uh, he's just a human being and he is uh, just a prophet, so on and so forth. And uh, so that led me to re read their book. And in fact, in that book, I'm sure you all know what book I'm talking about. Jesus is referred to as the Messiah. In fact, even he has been referred to as the one who was born by the conception of the Holy Spirit. Even the words Holy Spirit, Jesus being the Messiah, and that he did uh, many miracles, including raising the dead, are in that book. Many times, uh, people don't read what they think they know. The same thing applies to probably us as Christians. We need to read so that we know what is our mission, what is our purpose, what is the message, and so on and so forth. And uh, let us go to the opening prayer. I would like to ask uh, Elder Roy Sutton to offer the opening prayer. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Let's just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity where we all could come together on this platform, Lord, to worship you. Lord, we are thankful for the six days that you have given us. And for the seventh day, the Sabbath that you set aside, you sanctified and made it holy, Lord. May we totally give you this time, Lord, where we can reflect on your goodness and your kindness, Lord. May we open your words and study them, Lord. The Bible says, study to show ourselves approved unto God, Lord. Our, our, our workmen need it. Be ashamed, rightly dividing your word, Lord. Heavenly Father, we can look around in today's world, look at the news, and we know we're living in the last days, Lord. But Heavenly Father, help us not to go sleep, but to be awakened, Lord, and to shout the cry, Lord, the last message, Lord, the men and women who are still there in darkness, Lord, so that they can come and receive your light, so that we all can go home to be with you. Heavenly Father, we'd like to bring before you Everyone here, Lord, you know the concerns, Lord. You know the prayer requests, Lord. Lord, we place them before you. You know each and every individual, and we know that you'll hear and answer, Lord. Lord, we have faith and trust in you, knowing that you will work all things out, Lord. You work out good things, Lord, for everyone who believe on in your promises and believe in your word, Lord. Help us to have faith and trust in you. Lord, we are living in the last days, Lord, and we just want to give this time to you, totally devoted to you, Lord. We pray that you'll be the speaker this evening. Please give the speaker the words to speak unto our hearts, Lord, that the words that's pertinent, Lord, to each and every one. There's a message, Lord, in this message this evening for everyone hearing, Lord. And the Heavenly Father, help us to open our minds, Lord, and tune our hearts, Lord, to you, Lord, into heavenly things, Lord, so that you can speak to us, Lord. And may we depart from here to do your will, Lord. But we're just thankful for your Sabbath day, your holy hours, Lord, where we can come apart from the regular mundane things of life, Lord. Help us not to be distracted of the daily things that we go through, Lord, but remain focused on a matter that is at hand, Lord. We know the time is short, Lord. Your coming is near, Lord, even at the door, Lord. So help us be, to be watchful and to be ready, Lord. But the only way we can do that, Lord, is in prayer and in the studying of your word, Lord. Lord, bless us and keep us this evening, Lord. Send the Holy Spirit, Lord, to be with us. Teach us and guide us this evening as you worship together and fellowship together, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Suhana Chikatla will read the scripture selection for tonight. Hello. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Um, today's scripture reading is Revelation 11, 11 to 13. Revelation 11, 11 to 13. 
and I'm reading from King James Version. And after these, after three days and half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men, seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. Uh, may God add his blessings to this uh, verse and uh, help us understand through uh, Pastor and Dr. Jessen so that we can uh, see, you know, where we stand in our life and examine ourselves. Thank you. And so we are uh, in the second last presentation in the Revelation series, and we are truly grateful to Dr. Jessen for uh, opening uh, our eyes, opening the scriptures, giving us uh, great truths indeed. And of course, uh, many thanks to Sister Pansy for arranging this series for the last two months. So I'm sure we'll be blessed today also. And one more thing I wanted to say about uh, what I was talking about in my introduction, that book, Quran. It says that Jesus will come back the second time. It is mentioned that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It is mentioned that Mary was told by Gabriel that Jesus will be conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned. So in a way, I was uh, telling uh, these uh, people who are well-intentioned, who believe in that book, of course, uh, that uh, you know, a mere human being or a prophet cannot be the Messiah. No man can save any other man from death. And so the only person to believe in who is going to come back and all prophets will face that particular person is Jesus Christ. No other name, no uh, other belief uh, that contradicts that will uh, save anybody. And so let us uh, witness in this way as we study the book of Revelation. And so here is... Uh, and so when I said that, uh, when I posted those on, uh, you know, uh, Facebook, for example, uh, no response after that. So Jesus is the only way. Let us not take that for granted that we know that. Many people don't know. Many people don't know that it's in that book. So there are mentions of three gods, so to speak. Allah the Father, Allah the Son, Jesus Christ, and Allah the Holy Spirit. There's no way to Allah. Besides Jesus Christ, Allah came from the word Elohim or Yahweh or I am. And Jesus said, I am. I am the great I am. And before Abraham was, I am. And so after I witnessed like this, after studying, uh, you know, the Quran and I posted this, they don't have anything else to respond to that. And so it is very important. It's a matter of life and death as to what we believe. So Dr. Jason, here's your time. Thank you very much, um, Brother Anand. Really appreciate those words, um, uplifting our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, his holy word. Happy Sabbath, dear Hopeside family. It's an honor, it's a privilege to, to be a mouthpiece for the Most High. It's, it is all because of God's goodness and his mercy that he is willing to use broken instruments like us to sing his song, to speak his words. It is all because of him and may his name be praised forever and ever. Please give me a moment to share my screen with you. We are looking at the seven trumpets. And this is a 
This is a very interesting study. And we praise God that, that we are, we'll be wrapping up this seven trumpets today. And I want us to uh, just reinforce the, the structure of uh, the passage of the seven trumpets, beginning from uh, Revelation chapter 8, uh, 8 verse 2, all the way to Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. We see John, even though he was a fisherman, not much formal education, but John and uh, the Bible writers, when they received visions, inspiration from the Holy Spirit, they had to write down in their own words, in their own style. But we see, we see them following a style. And here, John is following the style which he uses for the seven churches, the seven seals, and the seven trumpets. And later in in the passage about the seven plagues, he again follows the same style of writing. The literary structure of the seven trumpets. We saw the introduction in Revelation chapter 8, verses 2 to 6. We saw the angel at the golden altar who, had, who was given much incense. And he added that incense to the prayers of the saints. And we understood that it, that angel, that special angel standing at the golden altar before the throne of God is none other than your Savior and my Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. After that introduction, then we see John writing about the six trumpets, the first six trumpets from Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, and goes all the way to Revelation chapter 9, verse 21. First six trumpets. And then we see an well or an interlude. The scene changes from the blowing of the trumpets to something else, an interval. And we, we noticed that this interval is longer than the interval between the sixth seal, opening of the sixth seal and the opening of the seventh seal. When we looked at the seven seals, we saw during the, uh, after the opening of the sixth seal, we saw the sealing of God's people on their foreheads. We saw one event. But then when we come to this passage of the seven trumpets, during the interval, we see even more things happening more details because that is the that is the the purpose of apocalyptic prophecy in apocalyptic prophecy we find repetition and each time it is repeated there is enlargement more details are given we praise god and then we see in this structure after that interval a, a long interval, we see the seventh trumpet sounding. Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 to 18. Please uh, look at the, the interval. During this interval between the sounding of the sixth and the seventh trumpets, we find the birth of the remnant church. God raising up the remnant church. We praise God in fulfillment of prophecy. And today we'll be looking at the interval. During this interval, 
between after the sounding of the sixth trumpet and before the sounding of the seventh judgment in heaven and french revolution yes friends we praise god because today in in revelation chapter 11 we will be we will be looking at a prophecy 1260 days prophecy we will also be looking at the sanctuary in heaven and we will be studying the two witnesses and we will be looking at the result of rejecting reformation we have to reap revolution and then we see the resurrection the, the two witnesses were killed but they resurrected a resurgence of the two witnesses we we praise god we praise god and then we will look at the seventh trumpet the final trumpet we praise god let's go we need to fly through this study today i want us to see this prophecy the 1260 days prophecy is really very significant in the book of Revelation. Because this 1260 days prophecy is mentioned five times in the book of Revelation. On the screen for us, those references. 1260 days prophecy mentioned five times just one prophecy not only in the book of revelation this same prophecy is also mentioned in the book of daniel twice in the book of daniel daniel 7 uh, daniel 725 and daniel 12 7 1260 days prophecy so this prophecy mentioned seven times in the Holy Scriptures is truly significant for us. And today, our passage in Revelation chapter 11 actually begins with this prophecy. Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, God raised up the remnant church to be a prophetic movement and you and i are part of that prophetic movement and god has revealed these things to us that we may prepare our lives for the soon coming of our lord jesus christ the seventh trumpet is the second coming of our lord jesus christ and we are living in this time of transition between the sixth trumpet and the seventh. The battle is about to close. And Jesus wants us to be on his side. The battle will not be long. We need to hold on to our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming. Behold, he is even at the door. He is coming. We praise God that you and I have this opportunity to sound the trumpet. That Jesus is coming to prepare ourselves, to prepare others for his second coming. Today, Revelation chapter 11 talks about the French Revolution. And sometimes we, we ask the question, does this French Revolution deserve a place in the holy scriptures we see the answer french revolution influenced the modern world the modern thinking and mindset french revolution has changed the world's history by inducing a spirit of modernism Yes, friends, questioning and brought in critic, uh, 
critical thinking. Yes, we need to be critical in our thinking. But has brought in what scholars call higher criticism. Criticizing God's word. Doubting God's word. France. We see France in the in the 18th century, especially towards the close of the 18th century, showed outstanding hatred against Christianity. And you may say, France, a Christian country. France, actually, historians tell us that France was called the eldest daughter of Roman Catholicism. It was France that defended papacy. It was France that punished those who spoke against the papacy. France called the daughter of Roman Catholicism, the eldest daughter of Catholicism. We know the eldest daughters are extremely special to the family. Whenever something happens to the father or mother, the eldest daughter steps in to take care of the parents. And it was France who was actually defending Catholicism, turned against Catholicism, turned against Christianity. And you may say, why? Why did, why did France, a Christian nation, eldest daughter of Catholicism, turn against Catholicism and Christianity? Because, friends, France received a false version of Christianity. A false version of Christianity. False version of Christianity seems to be, appears to transform lives. Only appears. False Christianity is manipulative. False Christianity is selfish. It's empty and leaves us more empty. We saw we saw during when the third angel sounded the third trumpet. What happened? The waters were poisoned. And all who drank that water died. When the fourth angel sounded the fourth trumpet. There was a darkening of the sun. Moon and stars. Catholicism brought darkness into Christianity, poisoned the water of life and the bread of life. And so Catholicism actually spread false Christianity. False Christianity is manipulative, selfish, only appears to transform lives, but it's empty. Only true Christianity can transform lives. Brothers and sisters, we see when false Christianity was spreading, poisoning the minds of the people, darkening their lives, God allowed Islam to come up to paralyze false Christianity. We studied Last time we were together, that those that 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 those uh, uh, those locusts they could sting like scorpions, but they had no power to kill, but only to inflict pain. Islam could not wipe out Christianity; could only paralyze Christianity, and Islam. Defended Islam was like a shield for true Christianity. 
we will see in Revelation chapter 11 how France expressed outstanding hatred against Christianity. What did France do in 1793 towards the close of the 18th century? They changed the calendar of seven days to 10 days and they called each 10th day of the week decade day and on every decade day in France they had a celebration what did they do on the first decade day in 1793 they made a large image to goddess nature and celebrated freedom of religion they brought a donkey and they, they placed a half-naked harlot on the donkey. And to the tail of the donkey, they tied a Bible. And they said, she is our goddess. She represents nature. And they brought the Bibles and Christian literature and had a bonfire in Paris. They turned churches into dancing halls. A terrible thing happened. Let us go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. Revelation chapter 11 is actually a continuation of Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, we saw the sweet experience and the bitter experience. The sweet experience referring to William Miller and his associates preaching about the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the 1830s and 40s. And when the second coming of Jesus did not take place. They became disappointed. They were bitterly disappointed. Referring to that bitter experience. But after that bitter experience. The angel said, the mighty angel. Jesus said, you must prophesy again. Please don't stop prophesying. This time to more people. Let's go. The continuation. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. Then. We see this continuation. Then. I was given a reed. Like a measuring rod. John was given. A measuring rod. Something to measure. And the angel stood. Saying. Rise and measure. The temple of God. The altar. And those who worship there. Measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship there. To, to, today, brothers and sisters, this verse tells, you, tells me, it reveals to you and me that God is measuring his worshippers. All who worship in the temple, measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship there. Which means all who worship God, all who worship, all who engage in true worship are secure. Because God is noticing them. His eyes are on them. God's eyes are on you. You are secure. You are, you are counted in the family of God. Measure on them, those who worship there. But what about the others? Revelation chapter 11 verse 2. But leave the courtyard. But leave, the, leave out the court. Which is outside the temple. Do not measure it. For it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot. 42 months. You don't need to count those. Who are outside in the courtyard. Who, who don't know the value, 
who don't know the difference between the sacred and the common, between the holy and the unholy, between the chosen and the strange. Leave them outside. They will trample the holy city for 42 months, referring to 1,260 days. Yes, friends, they will trample. But we praise God. We praise God. God is a God of mercy and compassion. His mercies are new every day. Great is his faithfulness. And he says in verse 3, I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. I will not leave them. I will have my two witnesses. They will prophesy in sackcloth. That even during, even to those people who are outside. Because of the ministry of my two witnesses. Some of them may accept the gospel. And they may come in and they can be counted. What a gracious God we have. He doesn't leave anyone. The gospel must be preached. The three angels message must be sounded. Must be told to everyone. Because God is in the business of measuring. Counting. In other words, judging. Judgment is beginning for God's people. Yes, brothers and sisters, for those disappointed believers, they found the answer to their great disappointment in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. In the sanctuary, we see in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. Measure the temple of God. The altar and those who worship. Measuring refers to judging. They found the answer in the sanctuary. The remnant church was raised up. To declare to the world. The sanctuary of God. Because it is in the sanctuary of God. The plan of salvation is clearly outlined. In the sanctuary. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Psalm 77, verse 13. The way to God is found in the sanctuary. When Jacob was running away. And away from the family. Felt very lonely. Felt he was away from God. Felt disconnected from God. But God put a ladder. In his dream, he saw a ladder. From the place where he was. To the place where God is. Yes, friends. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. The disappointed believers they found, they found the truth, the explanation for the disappointment in the sanctuary. Today, our, our greatest contribution, the greatest contribution of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to the world is in the area of the sanctuary. We praise God because the Sabbath truth was brought to this little flock, to this disappointed flock, was brought from the Seventh-day Baptists. We praise God. We praise God that this little flock, this disappointed flock, immediately embraced the Seventh-day Sabbath truth. We praise God. Now the question for us, the question for us, who are the two witnesses. Some say, yeah, those two witnesses are 
Moses and Elijah. Others say Caleb and Joshua. Who stood for God. Remember those 12 spies? 10 of them. They gave a, a gloomy picture. About, about Canaan. But these two witnesses. These two spies. Joshua and Caleb. They said we can go at once. Let's cross over. And let's take over the promised land. Two witnesses stood for God. Who are these two witnesses? Others say. The witnesses must be Joshua and Jerubabel. Who returned from exile. And who brought along with them. The captives from Babylon. And Joshua and Zerubbabel. Joshua as the high priest at that time. And Zerubbabel as the governor. They helped in rebuilding Jerusalem. Especially in rebuilding the temple after the exile. Still others say those two witnesses must be Paul and Barnabas. Who went on that missionary journeys. Taking the gospel to everyone. Jews and Gentiles. But who are the two witnesses? Yes, friends. The two witnesses are, we see, the two witnesses are, cannot be, the two witnesses cannot be any two human beings. Because according to Revelation chapter 11 verse 2, the two witnesses, uh, verse 3, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These two witnesses were to prophesy 1,260 days. Which means in prophecy, 1,260 years. No human being lived that long. Or if we, if we connect these human beings, if we add their, uh, their lifetime, their ages will not come to 1,260 years. For example, Moses and Elijah, some Scholars say, uh, according to verse, uh, verse 5, 11 verse 5, if anyone wants to harm those two witnesses, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. We find Elijah. When uh, in Second uh, Kings chapter 1, when the king of Israel sent for Elijah, when a captain came with 50 of his men and said, Elijah, to come down from the mountain, the king is calling for you. Elijah called for fire and those 50 and the captain were destroyed. A second group came with another captain. They were also destroyed by fire. His friends. So some say this must be Elijah. Verse 6, Revelation chapter 11, verse 6. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. We find a prophet who shut the sky from not raining. You know that his name, Elijah. For three and a half years, it did not rain. Famine in Israel. During the time of Ahab. And then you go to the second part of Revelation chapter 11 verse 6. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. To turn the water to blood. And to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they deserve. We see Moses bringing in ten plagues upon Egypt. And so some scholars or many scholars, they say, these two witnesses must be Moses and Elijah. 
But if we put their ages together, Moses lived 120 years. What about Elijah? He didn't even die. He was taken to heaven without tasting death. How can we put them together? Because an exact time is given for their prophesy. This cannot be Moses and Elijah. Or cannot be Caleb and Joshua. Or cannot be Joshua and Zerubbabel or Paul and Barnabas. Because no two human beings lived for such a long span of time. We have a hint here in, uh, in, Revelation, in Revelation chapter 11 verse 4. These are two olive trees. These two witnesses are two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. We find in Zechariah chapter 4, we find two lampstands and an olive tree supplying olive oil. Yes, friends, we can draw a clue from this. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is a lamp to us. It is shining, showing the path in the darkness to sinners like us, drawing us to Jesus. And how did we get this lamp? Through the Holy Spirit. Through inspiration, the Holy Spirit inspired 40 men of God. And through the inspiration, they have written to us the Holy Scriptures, a lamp to us. These two witnesses refer to the Old Testament and the New Testament. We praise God because John Chapter 5, verse 39, your Savior and my Savior says, He search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they testify of me. A witness is one who testifies of someone else. The Holy Scriptures testify of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament testifies of Jesus who was to come. Testifies of the Messiah. The New Testament testifies of the Messiah who came, who died for our sins, who resurrected for us, who is interceding for us in heaven. Testifies of our soon coming King. Yes, friends, the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 refers to the Old Testament and the New Testament. And during those 1260 years, the Bible says that the two witnesses will be witnessing in sackcloth. Do you know why? During those 1260 years, beginning from 539 AD to 1798 AD, this time period is called the period of dark ages. When the Holy Scriptures was, was trampled to the ground. When there was no light. Because traditions took the place of the Holy Scriptures during those 1260 years. The Roman Catholic Church put aside the word of God. Brought darkness. False teachings into the Christian church. As friends, we see. The bottomless pit. We see in Revelation chapter 11 verse 7. When they finish their testimony. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Will make war against them. Overcome them. And kill them. What is this? This beast refers to France. And made war against the holy scriptures. These two witnesses. And destroyed, seemingly destroyed, these two witnesses. 
and we see in verse 8 and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city which is which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified their dead bodies were were not allowed to be buried were thrown on the streets on the streets of Sodom and Egypt and John records where our also our Lord was crucified. Was Jesus crucified in Sodom and Egypt? No. Not literal Sodom. Not literal Egypt. It's true. Jesus was crucified in Sodom. Because of their, of their spirit against God. Into immorality, deep seated immorality. And Egypt is known in the Holy Scriptures, in the Bible, for its deep seated atheism. Because when Moses said, The God of heaven says, Let my people go, what did Pharaoh say? I don't know God. I don't know him denying the existence of God. Not that he did not have any awareness of God, but that he was denying his existence. And so here we find these indicators of immorality and atheism. Yes, friends, we see the bottomless pit refers to France because we find France, France was influenced by this, this infidel writer named Thomas Paine. And Thomas Paine said, I detest the Old Testament. France was influenced by this thinking. And we also see Francois Walter, a French man who spoke against the miracles in the Bible. He especially spoke against. Against the virgin birth. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. And do you know. Last time we were together. We saw William Miller. Reading. The works. The writings of. Thomas Paine. And Francois Walter. He became a deist coming from a, a Christian family, a Baptist background. If not for the grace of God, if not for the grace of God, what would have happened to William Miller? Today, some of us begin like this. But by the grace of God, God pulls us out. Paul says in Ephesians, but God, if not for God, his mercy, we would have been become the children of wrath, sons of disobedience, but God delivers us. Yes, friends, today, the education, our children in our elementary, in our high schools, they read these teachings. Our young people are attracted to these atheistic genres. His intervention in our families. We must pray for our children. Our schools, our centers of higher learning. May God help. May God preserve our young people. May God bring them from the land of captivity. As God brought William Miller. France was influenced by the teachings of Thomas Paine and Franco Walter. And especially when that Lisbon earthquake took place in 1755. 
Walter, he said, God doesn't care for us. He is not interested in us. We have to protect ourselves. We have to defend ourselves. There is no God. There is no God. He is not interested in us. France, a Christian country, now turned against Jesus Christ, against the Holy Scriptures, against Christianity. Yes, friends, during that time, November 26, 1793 to June 17, 1797, for those three and a half years, No Bible, no commandments. The churches was, were turned to dancing halls. Priests were killed. Others were exiled. Still others, they renounced. We will not be priests. Terrible thing happened. They burned Bibles. And made bonfire in the city of Paris. Yes, friends, during this time, during those three and a half years, we see <clears throat> during those three and a half years, no peace in France. Robberies, adulteries, immorality increased in France. Not only women and children were unsafe in France, even men. And so the Bible says, Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, referring to the true witnesses. And they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. Yes, friends. And the first daughter of the Roman Catholic Church turned against Christianity. If anyone spoke against the Roman Catholic Church, France took the responsibility to silence the heretics by, their by either imposing a fine or executing them. In Paris, a woman was taken in procession on a donkey, a harlot, as the goddess of reason into the prestigious cathedral of Paris, all to show their hatred against Christianity. Seven months after the end of French Revolution, you know what happened? On February 15, 1798, Pope Pius, Pius VI, the Pope, the reigning Pope at that time, in the Sistine Chapel in Rome, in the Vatican, he was celebrating his accession year. And it was at that time, the French army under Napoleon, Napoleon did not come, but he sent only his general, Louis Berthier. The French army entered Rome Took, prison, took Pope as a prisoner. The Swiss guards were there. They didn't move. They allowed the French army to arrest the Pope and take him to France. And later, the next year, Pope died as a prisoner in France. France turned against him. Christian against Christianity. Yes, friends. Churches into dancing halls. Bibles, equipment used in the church. Burnt. During this French Revolution, 5,000 priests were killed. 40,000 priests exiled to Spain and England. 20,000 priests resigned as priests in fear. During those three and a half years, no law, no order in France. Robberies, murder, murderers, adultery, murders, adultery, 
all over France. No safety, no security for women, children, and even men. The witnesses, the people thought they were killed, left unburied. But then, after three and a half years, the Spirit of God entered them. They came back to life. The two witnesses. And the Bible says they ascended to heaven. In the scripture reading, we saw in verse 12, they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. The two witnesses heard the voice, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies stopped them. Yes, friends, they ascended to heaven in the sight of all. What is the meaning of this? In spite of the French Revolution and the continuing anti-Christian spirit today, the Bible still flourishes. Ascended to heaven means the Holy Scriptures now influencing more people in a greater level. First Peter chapter 1 verses 24 to 25 tells us, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, the flower and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Come up here to witnesses. The word of the Lord endureth forever. After the French Revolution, on the screen for us, after the brutal suppression of the word of God, a dramatic change took place. Christianity entered the most brilliant era. Like grass that grows after rain, like the sun that comes up out of the clouds, like children dashing out of the school when the recess bell is given. Christianity spread in leaps and bounds. Just a few years after the peak of the French Revolution, what happened? 1800, Joseph Hughes, a Baptist pastor, had the vision of distributing Bibles to all. And he started, we praise God, he started British and Foreign Bible Society in 1804. We praise God to print Bibles and to distribute Bibles to all. Come up here. Those two witnesses now resurrected and ascending now. We praise God. In 1816, American Bible Society was established. And more Bible societies established. Today, the Bible most, most circulated. The word of the Lord endureth forever. Hallelujah. Thomas Paine is dead, but the Bible lives on. Spoke against the Bible. But the man is dead and gone. The Bible lives on. Walter is dead. But Christians still, still celebrate the birth and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible lives on. Frenchmen burned Bibles, closed the churches. Those violent people were dead and gone. But the Bible lives on. As I said, John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. If only France accepted Bible Christianity, God could have prevented the French Revolution. France, as a Christian country, if it accepted the Reformation, the Sola Scriptura, God could have prevented that episode of French Revolution. Dear brothers and sisters, our beliefs impact our behavior. France adopted false Christianity. False Christianity is selfish and manipulative. Today, 
God is telling to each one of us, God will be for all. All clergy, all lady. God sends warnings. If we reject his warnings, then God has to withdraw from us. France rejected the reformation. Had to reap the revolution. The Catholic Church rejected reformation. Had to reap revolution. After French Revolution, the Catholic Church received a deadly wound. Pope Pius VI was taken, arrested, taken as a prisoner. It was a deadly wound for Roman Catholicism. If we continue to allow, if we continue in our erroneous teachings, what will happen? God will allow our errors to confuse us and to corrupt us. And later, he will allow our enemies to conquer us and to take us into spiritual captivity. Isaiah 51 verse 7, Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. Jesus is calling us. He's calling us. Yes, friends, the great disappointment. They were bitterly disappointed, but found the truth in the sanctuary truth. They understood. They were consoled. They were comforted. Our Savior moved from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary into the most holy place to begin measuring the people who worship in the sanctuary. You're engaged in true worship. You are secure. You are safe. Engaged in false worship. There is no security. Those errors will confuse us. Those errors will corrupt us. And we will be led into captivity by the evil one. Yes, friends. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 tells us, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world, the kingdoms of this world, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. The seventh angel is about to sound the trumpet. Second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, friends. In Revelation chapter 10, those believers who waited eagerly, who prepared sincerely for the second coming of Jesus, they truly waited. But that was not the time for the second coming of Jesus. But you and I are now living in the time of the second coming. I just want to bring one person. This man's name, Leonard Hastings, farmer in New Hampshire, believed in the soon return of Jesus Christ. Not much formal education, just a farmer. He could not give a Bible study to anyone. But you know, how did he testify about the soon coming of Jesus? He left his potatoes in the ground. As he waited for the second coming of Jesus in 1844. Friends came to him and said, Leonard, we can harvest for you. We can store them for you. We'll help you. I said, no, no, no. Let my potato farm be a witness for the soon coming of Jesus. He is coming. He is even at the door. We don't need these potatoes. We praise God. This man, this man, sincere in his faith. Others, top ritual and sincere in their faith. As we close, we're sincere. Our history talks of a family named the Ball family. Few, few days before 
18, October 22nd, 1844. This family stopped attending church. And the other believers were concerned. Because. And the father of that Ball family. Was a great burden. Because they had a huge financial debt. And he was convicted. How can I meet my Lord? With this debt on our family. They sold their farm. They sold their horses. They sold their furniture. Still couldn't pay the debt. And that last Sunday. Before that October 22nd, 1844. An elder in that congregation in Washington. Said. Said to the pastor Frederick Wheeler. This family is going through some financial stress. And Frederick Wheeler, the pastor, he said, friends, Jesus is coming. What will we do with this money that we have? Took up an offering and helped their brother clear their financial debt so that they can all meet Jesus. All our debts cleared. All our sins forgiven. Because the seventh angel is about to sound the trumpet. Jesus is coming. This is the time. Friends, the battle is about to end. He is coming. He's even at the door. May we prepare ourselves. And may we be agents of God in preparing others. May you, may you and I live in the sanctuary of God for only under his wings we have safety security may that be our experience amen amen thank you Dr. Jason for that uh, great presentation about the effect or the effects of rejecting reformation God's word will always triumph no matter who may try to minimize it, downplay it, or twist it, or corrupt it, or pervert it. Let that not be forgotten. Even in our own lives, let us always diligently be open to God's reforming power in our lives. Here are the prayer requests, same names like last week. This is Julie. Mrs. Mary, Mrs. Dorcas, Mr. Tia Ruldas, Mrs. Rhoda Shinge, Pastor Chandrakant Shinge, and Mr. Mesifin. Remember them in your prayers. And now I would like to ask Dr. Jessen to offer the closing prayer. Please bow with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, you have set before us life and death. There is before us truth and error. We want to choose you, the truth, the way, the life. We choose you. We want to stand on your side because you are the conqueror in this great controversy. Under your wings, we have refuge. And under your wings, there is healing. Father, at this time, we want to lift up our brothers, our sisters, who are in need of physical healing. We praise you. We adore you for the healing mercies you have granted to our brothers and sisters. Father, we intercede before your feet. Lord, we lift up our sisters, Sister Julie, Sister Mary, Sister Dorcas. Lord, your grace is sufficient for them because you are the great physician. We look up to you. We also lift up our brothers, Brother Arul Das and Brother Mesfin, 
we ask you, Father, for your intervention in their lives. We also lift up Pastor and Mrs. Shinge. Lord, visit them, precious Father. Your grace is sufficient, my Lord. Father, the rest of us, we are also in need of physical healing, mental, spiritual healing. Please, Lord, if any one of us walking in any error, Lord, may your word reveal to us. Let the light shine in our lives. Any secret sin in our lives. Father, please, please, Lord, cleanse us today in the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Father, prepare us for your coming. When the seventh angel sounds the trumpet, when the sky will be rolled as a scroll, when the dead in Christ will be rising from their graves, when the living will be translated in a moment. We want to be there. We want to see your face. Please have mercy on us. Count us in, Father. Keep us under your wings always. Now and forevermore, for we ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining and uh, we had a great time together. So next week will be the last uh, presentation and uh, I hope that you will invite others and edify yourself as well. And so now let us meet. Thank you, Anna, uh, for another wonderful message. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I didn't know about all this French Revolution playing such a big part. I don't remember uh, that when we studied in Spice, I didn't remember that part. So thank you for shedding light on it and bringing, I remember the, you know, Voltaire. Mm. I remember that, yeah, very well, but I didn't, I forgot about the, so thank you so much and um, how they played such a big part, you know, the Islam and now the French. Thank you so much and thank you for coming every day, every weekend, mm -hmm. shedding so much light. Praise God, Ma. praise God. Yes. Very welcome. Thank you, Dr. Jessen, for that message and shedding so much light. All that I knew about French Revolution is the tale of two cities. Only now did I realize that it is really connected with Christianity too. Thank you. And I wish this series were not coming to an end. But God bless you. Bless your ministry. Thank you. And God. I thank all, uh, uh, Pastor Alfred Raju and the others who joined from India early morning. God bless you and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yeah. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, all of you.